right now, Pittsburgh's best sports show is about to begin. Call us or tweet us. We've got things to talk about on the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call. All right, thanks a lot, Justin. Thank you for tuning in to the Ireland Contract and Nightly Sports Cover. Rich Walsh, Andrew Filipponi will join me in a matter of moments. And there he is right there over to 93.7, the fan cam. Pony, the Lumber Company's back. This is how the Buckos are going to have to win games. Uh, they're going to have to out-hit the other team. Starting pitching struggled, which is concerning. Consider it's Mitch Keller. Uh, you would think that he would at least have a better performance, especially opening day, than he did here today. But, um, you know, I still think this team's around an 80-win team. I have them at 80 and 82. Uh, but, you know, you got to like a little. I, I like this lineup a lot more than I did last year. Well, they stole a game today. Uh, they won a game they probably should have lost, given how many times they had to come back and given some of the situations and extra innings where it looked like they were absolutely going to lose. You run yourself out of innings at home plate three in a row, 10, 11, and 12. You're not supposed to win games when that happens. When your ace struggles and stumbles, you're supposed to lose those games too, but give them credit. They fought back. Their bullpen did as advertised. They kept the game in a, in a place where the Pirates could storm back and tie the game and then eventually win the game. And that's without Majinski, who's hurt, and Holderman, who's sick. And that was uh, without Bednar, who didn't pitch in this game either. Very surprising that it was Hernandez, a guy who was supposed to start the season in Indianapolis, who came on to get the save there at the end of the game in extras. So... Very exciting game. Probably the O'Neill Cruz home run. The biggest thing to take away from this game for me, they need him to be the O'Neill Cruz before that injury last April and going the opposite way and showing that power, Richie. That is a very good sign for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yeah, they need the guys that they give big contracts to to perform. Guys like Brian Reynolds, he did today. O'Neill Cruz, you run, mentioned. Yep. Henry Davis had a hit. Um, you know, guys like that have to perform except for Mitch Keller here today, and he's the one guy you need to shut down the other lineup. Yeah, and Triolo came through with a hit to win the game, and he had an up-and-down game because he was not great in the field, which is very unlike him, dropping that ball that would have started a double play that was an unearned run against Mitch Keller. Now he's playing out of position, but he's got great glove work. Everyone raves about it down in the uh, spring training. was so high on him. Uh, so he was able to put that behind him and come through clutch late in the game. He's one of those guys for the Pirates that I think is a swing player. He won that job. He won that camp battle. And so you want him to be productive because you've got guys behind him who are knocking on the door like Pagaro and Gonzalez if he does not come through and produce. So that's a good thing when you've got multiple players who might be good options. Usually guys win jobs by default with the Pirates. That actually happened in the back end of the rotation, Richie, with a guy like Falter who made the team. And if they had signed better pitchers this offseason, Jared Jones, who he can throw hard and he's a rookie, he wouldn't have been up here either because they would have had better options than even him. So 1-0, uh, and better than 0-1. And, and the Cubs tonight, Richie, their starting pitcher, their ace, Justin Steele, left that game against the Rangers with an injury. So that's another good thing going for the Pirates. Already a team in the division you're competing against, their big horse in the rotation might be hurt. Are you disappointed that they didn't make a run at one of these pitchers here that were available at one point? I mean, Trevor Bauer's still out there. Why not take a chance? Well, the Bauer thing's not going to happen. Uh, the Bauer situation is one where, you know, ownership said uh, to the baseball operations people, you can explore it, you can look into it. Uh, they didn't sign him. The Pirates didn't sign him. No one else has signed him. There's a lot of stuff going on with Bauer, and it's not just – off the field issues. He's just not a well-liked guy. Garrett Cole can't stand him, hates his, hates his guts. I think there's the, uh, the, under, the the impression out there or the belief that he's just not someone you want to bring into your clubhouse. And it's been a long time since he was a good pitcher, two years ago since he last pitched in the major league. So it's not just the Pirates that have passed on Bauer. It's the other 29 teams. But to answer your question, Richie, yeah, I wanted the Pirates to go out and get someone on more than just a one-year contract who could be a fixture in their rotation. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, Domingo Herman when he's available to pitch, if at all. And then, of course, Paul Skeens, who's going to make his AAA debut soon. And I'm hoping we see him, Richie, in May, and we don't have to wait until June or July. Yeah, that would be nice for him coming up here in May. All right, we're going to take a break. Phone lines are jam-packed right now. We're taking your phone calls. Coming up next, stay right there. 
All right, welcome back to the Island Contracting Nightly Sports Call. Here's our tweet of uh, the night from GMC. The Pirates secure the first extra inning win of the 2024 season. Uh, big, nice come from behind a couple times like we just talked about for the Pirates. Uh, showed off those bats, and that's what's going to have to carry them this year, uh, especially if that starting pitching struggles. All right, uh, it's kind of a favorable schedule. Not favorable, but, you know, they could take two out of three against Miami, two out of three potentially against the Nationals, they got to get off to a good start. I feel like a team like this, even though they did last year and didn't really work out for them, I feel like this team, young, get off to a hot start. You build some momentum, get some confidence. I think that's how they get to that 80-plus win point. Well, I think it's important because some of these guys that are uh, important cogs to what the Pirates are trying to do, these are players that are on one-year contracts. So Martin Perez, their number two starter right now, He's on a one-year deal. Gonzalez in the rotation, one-year deal. Chapman, your setup man, one-year deal. Telez, your starting first baseman, one-year deal. Taylor, your starting center fielder, one-year deal. I mean, if this team is uh, a few games out, if they're under 500 uh, and near the middle of the season, they're going to get traded. So you need to give this organization and this front office reason to keep these guys around. And so that's why... Really, you can't be the type of team that struggles in the first half of the season and bounces back in the second half because if you dig yourself a hole, Richie, they'll probably trade these guys for prospects at the deadline. Yeah, if they can get anything for them, for sure. That's why you sign guys like that, and some of those guys, especially Chapman. Let's go out to Big Lou out in Baldwin. How you doing, Lou? What's Big up, Lou. Guys? How you doing tonight? What's going on? Hey, the game today, uh, I think... Extra innings, putting a man on second, and then there's just too many run downs. It's dangerous. Guys should get hurt. I think there should be a max of 12 innings and have a tie. What do you think? Uh, I don't know where I stand on the tie. I mean, I, I look, I know this sounds crazy. I know. I, I, think I know start... where I stand. That's one of the, no, yeah. no disrespect, Lou. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard on this show. We're going to have ties in baseball now. I'd rather ties. see like what a home run. <laughs> I'd rather see a home run derby type thing or something. Home run derby, uh, well, how about saying. they just keep playing baseball? This is not a contact sport. It's not football where they're beating the heck out of each other for three hours. It ain't even hockey where they're going up and down the ice for two and a half hours. They're playing baseball. It's not demanding. I understand that there are pitchers, but you've got minor leagues and guys can get called up and down. And like the Pirates brought Luis Ortiz into this game. He can go five or six innings and throw 80 pitches if you need him to. Ties? Uh, Richie, look, what is this now? I, I, Pony, ties? I'm not trying to debate you. I don't like ties. I don't want to see ties, but I'd say rather than, rather than seeing something crazy, I'd rather see a home run derby than just stop it at nine innings or 12 innings. I want to see them play too. I don't even like the runner on second base thing. I just want to see them play baseball. I don't baseball. either. Just, yeah. just play regular baseball, and if it goes 18, 19 innings like it does once every blue moon, well then, okay, that's fine. There's been memorable Pirates games that have gone long, like that 18-inning game where Pedro Alvarez hit the home run in St. Louis to win a game a few years ago, going 10 years ago now. How about the game they got robbed against the yeah. Braves with the Jerry Meals play? They didn't start a runner on second base in those games, so I've got no problem. Just play traditional old-fashioned baseball. I don't want to hear the big lose of the world saying, let's end it in a tie. Huh. What's next? Let's give out a good sportsmanship <laughs> award at the end of the games, too, and give everybody orange slices and a trophy <laughs> for these games? Come on, Lou. All right, let's go out to John in Oil City. How you doing, John? Hi, John. Hey, I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I just had a uh, comment about the base running. Uh, the, they've been running into outs at home plate for a long time. I just wanted to see your comment about, is it the players or is it the coaches? It's, uh, somebody, something's got to change, though. You know, Pony, I, I look, I know they've been doing it, and I think it's just being aggressive. I don't mind it sometimes. You, you take a gamble here and there. Maybe it happens too often with the Pirates, but I like being aggressive. I like, I like taking shots, especially if you're the Pirates and you're already, uh, you, your payroll is already low and you, are, you don't have as much talent as other teams out there. So gamble. Yeah, I don't like making the second out of an inning at home plate, okay? When you've got an opportunity to have a runner at third with one out, that guy can score, and it doesn't even have to be a base hit to do that. So that Henry Davis play where the ball gets thrown by Josh Bell and it ricochets, and then the, and then Bell's able to get it back, I have no idea why the third base coach, Mike Rabella, with one out, is sending Henry Davis on that play, and it wasn't even close 
He was thrown out by a mile. That was a horrible, horrible decision. I would ask my third base coach to go get checked for glasses hmm. in Miami uh, tomorrow morning. It was so bad. Made absolutely no sense. So, yeah, I mean, I, that situation alone would have really – if the Pirates had lost this game, I would have blamed – bad base running for the loss because that was just pitiful even in the 12th what inning do you, what, what do you think about that one uh i honestly don't have as much see the the second one the running on contact play i don't have as much of a problem with because it's if you would have told me it's a ground ball and it's not like a ball that gets cut off in the grass it's one where bell has to make a play and then throw home I would want my runner to go there and test Josh Bell because we've watched him butcher those throws throughout his years in Pittsburgh. So that one I didn't have a problem with necessarily going on contact. There, the third one. Now, Cruz can't run there either, uh, Richie. He's got to stay at third, and he's got to give his team a chance to get a two-run lead because by getting thrown out, I mean, all the Marlins needed to do was score a run, bunt a guy over, get a sack fly, and all of a sudden they're going to the 13th inning. Yeah. All right, let's go out to Cole in Harrisburg. How you doing, Cole? Good. Thanks, thanks for having me on. So I wanted to know why you think the Pirates had Rowdy Telez starting at first base today for his left-handed pitcher. So since 2022, Telez has had an OPS below 650 against lefties, which includes a career year his where he had 35 home runs. They had Edward Olivares on the bench, who last year had an OPS in the mid-800s, over 200 points higher. I think they should have put Olivares in right field and Connor Joe at first. So with the next, I believe, four starting pitchers they face being lefties, do you think the Pirates should make a change, or should they continue to stay with the lineup they had today? You know what? You make a valid point. I, I don't. I. I honestly don't want to see Connor Joe in the lineup. Uh, that's me. I mean, he um, kills lefties, yeah, Richie. He's I know, great against left-handed pitching. He's outstanding. I don't want to see him hit leadoff. I want to see him in the lineup against lefties, though, because the caller's right about Tellez. Tellez is a strict platoon guy now who can't hit left-handed pitching. He hit one home run off of lefties all of last year, and his batting average was below 200. So I agree. Joe should have been at first, and Oliveris should have been in right field. And when Oliveris pinch hit for Tellez, Richie, do you know what he did? He yeah. went deep. Yeah. He hit a home run. Yeah, I, I liked all, what Oliveris did this spring. So obviously I like what he did here today, and I don't disagree with and that And Tellez is a big man. They got a yeah. pension. They like these big, bulky, husky first, base first basemen. Richie, how about these guys, Choi and... Vogel back before Vogel them. Back, yeah. Man. And now Telez. Uh, I think Telez will be good at home, uh, you know, at PNC Park. But, uh, you know, I, I, short porch. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't hear any of the post game uh, comments of, of why they decided to start Telez, but I would imagine just because he is their, you know, their, their first baseman. Um, well, but they didn't start Sawinski today. No, they didn't. They platooned right. him. Yep. All right, let's go out to Rebecca in Monroeville. How are you doing, Rebecca? Hi, Rebecca. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. I'd like to know why, when it's a 3-0 count, that they don't allow them to swing on the perfect pitch. I mean, everyone, I mean, that's just like a, a rule of thumb, right? I mean, everyone, they, they tell them to take the pitch, basically, at 3-0. I mean, you have a chance at a ball. It's a 50-50 chance right there. So I know sometimes, sometimes some coaches, you know, will give the go-ahead to players that they're confident in, that, that can maybe hit it out of the park. But... More than, more than not, I mean, I played baseball growing up. At 3-0 count, you're told to take that ball. I've never liked that. I've never been a fan of that. I, I believe in trusting your hitters. And if, and if the guy at the plate believes that here comes a 3-0 meatball and I can clobber this thing because it's a batting practice pitch, I want him to do so. I don't like in a situation like that setting a strict, harsh, red light, automatic take the pitch. Maybe at lower levels or when you're dealing with guys that aren't professional hitters, you do that. But in the big leagues, you know, unless like you're down a lot of runs and you need base runners, unless solo home run doesn't do much for you to start an inning or something like that. But no, I'm not a big fan of just telling guys, hey, you're not allowed to swing in a 3-0 situation. I don't do it with everyone, but there's some guys that I would do it with. Well, no doubt. I mean, if it's if it's Austin Hedges, you're right. I'd actually have him drop the bat <laughs> and just stand there. Rowdy Telez against so lefties. I'd tell him to take it. Rowdy Telez yeah. against lefties. Exactly. Let's go out to Big Dave Rowdy. and Zilliot Opal. How you doing, Dave? Hey, Dave. Yes. What's going on? How are you? <clears throat> Dave, you called us, buddy. Yeah, what do you got for what, us? What do you got? 
Uh, I'm talking about uh, the uh, Pirates victory. It was great. and uh, Loved it. I'm, it was not, I did not like the base running of the catcher today. He uh, went back to second base too far, and then he did not run when he hit the ball to the shortstop. He dropped it, and he yep. could have yeah. made it to first base if he just ran it out. Don't look at the other players. Just run to first base as hard as you can. Well, you see a lot of that in the majors. I mean, uh, stuff like that, you know. Uh, I, I, look, I know we always have we always complain about base running and and <laughs> this and that and um, you know they're valid points too at at times and today maybe you you pointed out a couple Davis was one O'Neill Cruz was another uh, but you're gonna you're gonna critique every game and you know base running has been a problem with the Pirates you know just hopefully that they can oh, cure yeah. that at some point I mean we've had guys run the bases with cell phones in their pockets uh, yeah with this team okay so yeah it's not been the most disciplined. I'm surprised by Davis because he usually goes all out all the time. And it's game one, so he's not tired. You know, this is not the dog days of summer here. It's the start of the season. So that was, I think, a surprising play from him. That play that he hit the ball to shortstop and didn't run it out. And the caller's right. Dave's right. He probably could have been safe. If yeah, he was that's a big pet peeve of beginning. mine, too, Pony. I, I hate seeing that. I mean, you're always told to, to run it out no matter what. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, you could get lucky yep. and... It could be a, a pass ball or something. All right, we gotta take a break. Back with more of your phone calls coming up next day right there. All right, welcome back to the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Garmer Walsh along with Andrew Filipponi for tonight's show. Pony, my bracket is busted. I had Arizona winning and playing Kentucky. So I just rip everything up oh. right now. Yeah, that was the not much of an expert. Well, we should have just gone with the ACC. If you went ACC in all these picks. You'd be undefeated right now because the only team that's lost was that horrible Virginia team in the play and everyone else undefeated 9-0. and Clemson to the Elite Eight since the first time since 1980. Pretty much led the entire way today. And North Carolina's looking good in this game against Alabama right now. They lead at the half. Duke tomorrow, NC State tomorrow, Richie. Makes you really wonder if Pitt had gotten in. Would they still be playing right now? I bet they would. I think I so, too. I still see Pitt. I, I think so, too. Pitt should have been in. I was at Pitt Pro Day yesterday talking to a couple of people there. They all thought Pitt should have been in, too. Of course, it's Pitt Pro Day. Uh, but, I mean, Pitt was on a run. They were one of the hottest teams in college basketball. It's a shame that we didn't get to see it. My invitation to Pitt Pro Day must have gotten lost in the mail. <laughs> Ever since I went there and I ran my own personal 40 and started doing my own workouts, I think they've banned me because they're afraid I'm going to hurt myself and then maybe sue. You were a coach, so that's too. Why. I can't believe you didn't get invited back. Pony, we got to go. We're out of time. I appreciate I it. We'll see you next see week. See you, Richie. Hopefully we see you guys after the games on KDK News.